Enrique Mera is a Sierra Leonean Ugandan translator, writer and policy researcher. She recently relocated to Milan, Italy after having lived in Burkina Faso for almost two decades. After years of translating academic and technical texts from French and Italian into English, Eri ventured into literary translation, observing that few African authors were being translated by American translators. Her translation of Monique Ilbudo's So Distant From My Life, published by Tilted Access Press in 2022, won a Penheim translation grant and was shortlisted for the 2023 National Translation in Prose Award in the U.S. She recently co-edited an anthology of essays, poems and visual discourses from the Sahara region, Sahara A Thousand Paths into the Future. Her own essays and poems have been featured in Africa as a Country, Brittle Paper, Courier International, Lolway, The Republic and World Sick 10. In this episode, she spoke about her writing career, translations and the book So Distant From My Life. Eri, uh, welcome to our podcast. Uh, so nice to have you with us today. I'm very pleased to be here. Thank you for having invited me. You have been a globetrotter uh, even during your formative years. You lived in many countries. And even your education, I think, uh, from different universities. You have degrees from different universities. May know the reason. What was the reason for that? Moving from one country to the other. <laughs> Um, yeah, I think it's the, the starting point is that my, my parents come from two opposite sides of the African continent, um, from Sierra Leone in West Africa and from Uganda in, in East Africa. And so they themselves to meet each other had traveled. Uh, they both met at university in Nigeria. Um, so I guess it was <laughs> almost our family destiny, um, that our family move around a lot. Um, so yeah, by the age of 18, I had, I had lived in, in five different countries, um, with short stints in, um, Sierra Leone and Uganda, my parents' respective countries. Uh, but then I spent my formative years of uh, middle school and high school in, in Kenya, which is where I started studying French. Uh, so I mainly translate from French into English. I also do Italian to English, but I work mostly with French. Uh, so I started studying French in Kenya. I had a uh, very enthusiastic uh, French teachers. And so I guess I fell in love with the language. And when I went to do my undergraduate uh, in the US, I chose to continue with French. I actually double majored. Um, I did economics and I did French uh, just because I, I knew I wanted to continue studying languages and um, having studied uh, French then led me to uh, move to France um, I, I with a, an initial plan to just stay for six months and then speak perfect French and of course that didn't work out um, after six months I realized <laughs> I still had a rather limited uh, knowledge of, of, of French and so I ended up um, ended up uh, applying to for a master's program in France and I, I did my master's at Sciences Po in, in Paris. And so in all, I stayed uh, three years in, in France. So when did you start writing? Hmm, when did I start writing? I recently started writing for general public, let's say about five years ago. Previously, I had done a lot of sort of policy and development policy work uh, for which I did do a lot of writing, but it was, you know, sort of technical reports and, and, and policy documents. And then about five years ago, I decided there were other topics and other approaches uh, towards writing that I wanted to experiment with. And that's when I started writing and publishing essays and, and, and poems for uh, the general public. And that's also when I, a few years later, I, I veered into a uh, literary translation. Okay, before getting into literary translations, uh, you're writing a lot of articles in, you know, about economics, uh, probably the policy issues and all that. Um, 
I have published, uh, I do publish uh, various policy reports. I've recently just worked on a, on a report uh, on the African fashion sector, for instance, with UNESCO. Uh, but I, I, I split my time about perhaps uh, sometimes 50-50, sometimes two thirds, one third. Uh, between my policy work and um, my own writing and uh, translation projects. So mostly at macro level, you would say. Yes, yes, yes. I think, I, I, I think from my, from my family background, you know, coming already from two different regions of Africa, and having lived in many countries, I think I, I, my natural viewpoint as a viewpoint that, that takes into consideration many different countries, sometimes many different regions. And I think that's a perspective that, that tends to attract me and also the perspective from which I, I can make a greater contribution. Do you think, you know, living in so many countries, coming across uh, different nationalities, languages and all, do you think that's what uh, led you to translations? That's a good question. I think, you know, strangely enough, um, so I grew up in a, in a multinational uh, household, but uh, because English was a common language between my parents, um, and at the time uh, there was a discourse about not confusing your kids with too many languages, I actually mostly grew up, uh, had a mostly a monolingual upbringing. Uh, our parents spoke English to us almost throughout our childhood. So it wasn't necessarily the fact of growing up in a multilingual household that pushed me towards languages. Then I always had, of course, different languages around me, even, even though I didn't necessarily understand them or speak them very well. For instance, I lived many years in Kenya, but I'm not a very good speaker of Swahili. But I, I think it was just through my decision to pursue French, there was something I enjoyed about language and just the the exercise of playing with language because I, I think at the base translation is, is a kind of game I think that's why I never gave up uh, studying French even though for a, a, a good 10 15 years of my life I was actually very very interested in economics but I never gave up languages and I, I volunteered to translate um, all the time during my policy work and also translated professionally academic writing and, and, and technical reports throughout my, my working years. You keep you know, writing for reputed publications across the world, mainly on matters related to West Africa, right? So the one of the most the interesting one that I found is uh, about uh, looted African heritage. Could you please tell us about it, that particular article? So I wrote that article, uh, which ended up with a title, Dear the West, Why Do You Find It So Hard to Say Sorry? I wrote it um, in December 2018, a few weeks after an influential report on the um, restitution of looted African heritage had been released in France. Mm -hmm. And I was somewhat shocked by the reaction the report elicited in, in the French art and policy circles. Because what seemed like a straightforward issue um, to me um, from an ethical point of view, um, so artifacts were taken from African countries during colonization, uh, sometimes through outright looting, uh, that is theft, uh, sometimes in uh, murky circumstances. And so if African countries ask for these back, they should be given back. But apparently that wasn't perceived in these terms by, um, by, some, by some French commentators. Yeah. So that got me thinking about what differences in um, more generally European worldviews and African worldviews could, could explain that. And the question of the place of forgiveness in the respective cultures uh, sprung to mind. Uh, because living in Burkina Faso, the uh, forgiveness is really omnipresent. People are urging you all the time, just forgive, just forgive, just forgive. That's how the, the idea for this, for this article came, came about. And um, it was the editor who suggested the title. Um, 
which initially I was not comfortable with, but uh, now I think I think it worked. That's the reason I read it. Right. It certainly caught people's attention. And the article was translated into German and into French. And there was a Finnish blog that also picked it up. Um, and I still see it circulating on social media today. Now, uh, how many years you lived in Burkina Faso? 17 years. 17 years. So yes. you, you're working or how is it? Uh, yes, I, we moved, uh, I moved to Burkina Faso with my husband, um, actually just after I, I finished my master's in, in France. Um, so I had been outside of the African continent for seven years, um, first in America, then in France. And I just felt I wanted to go back to Africa. And I gave my husband the the task of choosing the country. I said, I, I'm happy to live in any any African country. Um, you choose. And he chose Burkina Faso. How often do you get to read fiction? Um, I, I read a lot of fiction. If anything, I feel guilty about not reading enough nonfiction because uh, most of my own personal writing is in nonfiction. Uh, but I, yeah, I, I, I read a lot of fiction. Whenever you know, before going to bed, I read fiction. When I'm on a train, I read fiction. Um, what kind of books that you read? Yeah, well, I, I like to mix it up. Maybe the easiest way to respond to this question is to list the last books I read. Um, so I recently read *An Arrow of God* by Chinua Achebe. So that's a book that was written in the 60s, 70s, Nigerian writer. And uh, I I wanted to re- reread, um, I hadn't read that book by Chinua Achebe, but I've read other Chinua Achebe, but I wanted to reread it because I'm, I'm working on a, on a translation of a Malian work. And I, I felt like Chinua Achebe's language would give me some, some of a better feel of what, what I'm aiming for in that translation. And then I read a, an Ivorian novel. I read it in French uh, by Gauze, Le Boupé, but it's also been translated into English as Standing Heavy. So that's like a humorous account of Parisian life seen through the eyes of a, of a guard in, you know, in, in all these big department stores in, in Europe. You, you often have guards and in, in Paris there. A lot of them are Ivorians, so it's it's Parisian Parisian society seen from that perspective. And then, um, in terms of uh, literature from your part of the world, I have on my um, nightstand. I still have to start it. Um, Tomb of Sand by Gitanjali Shreen. Um, so I have been a fan of Indian writers writing in English uh, for many years. Uh, Salman Rushdie, Kiran Desai. Yeah. But I, I need to discover that whole world of Indian literature that is written in Indian languages first and then translated into English. So distant from my life is your first book length translation in fiction. You translated poems and uh, other uh, fiction too, right? So distant from my life was my first fiction uh, project. Uh, but I had been translating. Um, more or less since 2002 when I moved to France. So mostly, you know, technical texts, uh, policy work. But I, I think in terms of, you know, that attention to language that translation requires, I think it was it was good practice because when I embarked on the project, I said, gosh, I've never translated fiction. Will, will, will this work out? And it, it, was, it was almost a breeze. It was even easier than translating technical work, I'd say, because it was so much fun. So I, I, yeah, I think, you know, the previous translating that I'd done, which wasn't perhaps very artistic, not very literary, it, it did give me a certain baggage. And then, of course, it helps that I, I read a lot. Um, and I think, you know, reading a lot and writing a lot are also two of the essentials for, for good translating. So how vibrant is the literary scene in Burkina Faso? Right. Um, now, I no offense to Burkina Bay writers, but I'm going to respond and say that for me, the literary scene in Burkina is lively mostly through theater. 
And uh, perhaps that makes sense because, you know, the literacy rate in Burkina Faso is uh, it's very low. It's about 30%. Uh, and so theater, which, you know, which brings uh, literary works into an oral, uh, oral uh, setting, uh, works very well. Yes. Um, but of course, for good theater, you need good raw material. And uh, so in the 17 years that I, I lived in Burkina Faso, I saw so many excellent plays. And some of them were um, original plays written by Burkina Bay playwrights. And some of them were just absolutely brilliant adaptations of global works. Um, so for instance, there uh, I saw a fantastic adaptation of Shakespeare's A Merchant of Venice. Um, that became Aisha of Tumbuktu. But unfortunately, uh, not a lot of these playwrights are publishing their, their original works or their adaptations. I don't know if it's because the publishing industry in Burkina Faso is quite fragile, but I also have a sense, at least at the international level, plays seem to be out of fashion. I mean, there's so many publishing houses that, you know, that say outright, we don't accept submissions of, of, of plays. In Burkina Faso, the literature is written in French mostly, or uh, there are other languages too. They are other languages. Um, so, in terms of theater, you find a lot of local language theater. In terms of uh, publishing, um, I think Burkina Burkina Faso, with respect to other African countries, is still quite shy about pushing um, its languages into the written form and promoting literature directly written in uh Burkina Bay local language. So there's some there's some initiatives and there there's some um writers who are who are promoting um that path, but it's it's still at the early stages. Um and I, I think that's one of the things that I I admire when I look towards a country like India and you know to see just how much uh literature, li- literary production in Indian languages is is promoted. And that it's not just Indian writers writing in English that are um, getting to international audiences today, but also Indian writers writing in in Hindi, in uh, Malayam, and you know, I I think that's fantastic. Hindi, Malayalam, Tamil, of course, Bengali, the four languages uh, where a lot of uh, translations into English has also happened. Yeah, I think that's great, and that's yeah. that's where a lot of African countries need to be need to be moving towards. But when it comes to again, you know, English translations, to my limited knowledge, I'm not an expert on this, but uh, whatever that I could gather in the last uh, couple of years is that uh, getting these translations, English translations, published uh, for Anglophone world. When you when I say Anglophone world. In US or UK, presses from them. I think it's very limited that way. So agencies, these publishing houses, I guess they are limited to circulation mostly within India. In fact, uh, some of the wonderfully written English translations, uh, the other day, last week, I was trying to find them in Amazon.com to gift uh, somebody in US. I could not find these books on uh, Amazon in US. And uh, what about translations uh, from Burkina Faso? Any headway in that? So in terms of works, Burkina Bay works of fiction that have been translated into English, when I embarked on translating Monique Ilbudo's um, So Distant From My Life, I think one of the things that motivated me too was that I realized there had only been one novel no Bear Zongo's uh, The Parachute Drop that had been translated into English and then a collection of folk tales. And I thought, oh gosh, okay, of all the literary production that Burkina Faso has been able to produce, that's all that is um, available to the English-speaking world. And keeping in mind that the English-speaking world actually uh, also c- includes half or a little bit more than half of the African countries you know, I, I think it's that perspective that, that got me motivated, that, um, you know, the rest of my family doesn't speak French or certainly not doesn't speak French well enough to embark on reading a book in French. Uh, so here I was living in Burkina Faso, discovering uh, either written works or plays that I just found really amazing. And I tried to talk 
uh, about them to my family and they're like, oh, can we read them? Well, no, it's only in French. Gap that existed between English speaking and French speaking Africa, uh, because so little was translated into English from Burkina Faso, but it also applies to other um, French speaking West African countries. I think that was one of my my driving motivations to embark on this this first fiction translation. When did you come across uh, this novel? So Distant From My Life was published in French in 2018. And I think it was in 2019 that I went to a book launch with the author, Monique Ilboudot. I hadn't read the book at the time. And um, mm -hmm. so she obviously presented the book, did some readings. And then I saw how um, the, the, the participants at the book launch who had read the book, they were so enthusiastic about it. And then some of the comments that they made really, um, you know, got me curious. Um, so I picked up a copy and I, I read it on um, edit weekend. I, I read it, I think, in one, in one sitting in one day. And I really liked it. I really liked it. I, I especially liked the humor in it. And, um, and I thought her style, Monique's style of writing, is close to what my style would be if I wrote fiction. So I thought, yeah, I can translate this. French is spoken in different West African countries, right? Local, will there be any local variation in the way they use the language and they speak? Uh, yes. Um, I mean, it's all comprehensible between the languages. If you get a Burkina Bay in the same room as someone from Senegal, uh, both French-speaking countries, they'll be able to understand each other. But there are certainly um, variations in terms of uh, slang. Um, for instance, I mentioned uh, an Ivorian novel that I, I recently read uh, called Debout Payé, and that's mm -hmm. typical um, Ivorian slang. Um, there's a dialect called Nushi that's like an urban French-Ivorian uh, dialect and they they have these turns of phrases that are it's just very sharp street smart humor. So debu payé is the nushi term for a watchman, and it's literally paid for standing. Uh, yes. So you know that that describes <laughs> perfectly well yes. what watchmen are paid to do. <laughs> Um, yeah, so you know you have these variations. I mean, the first time I heard the term debu payé, I it took me, you know, I had to think about it a little bit, and then once I thought about it, it made absolute sense. Yeah, yeah, the variations from country to country. You have coded the anthology Sahara Thousand Paths into the Future. Tell us about the book. Right. Um, so I co-edited um, that anthology. Um, with Katerina Botanova and Queen Latimir. And it's part of um, a wider festival uh, organized in, in uh, Basel, Switzerland, every two years called Culturescapes. This year's edition is actually ongoing. It's entering its last week. Basically, Culturescapes every two years uh, chooses a geographical zone to hone in on, on the culture, the artistic expressions of that zone. And so they had chosen for this edition the Sahara. And so in the anthology, we, we, we collected um, essays, poems, and also visual discourses from artists from North Africa and uh, the southern fringes of the Sahara, so Western African countries too, uh, that could give um, readers uh, a, a snapshot and a wide view of, of, of the myriad uh, different expressions in that in that vast region. It's published by Sternberg Press, um, based in the U.S., and I believe it is available on Amazon in 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 many different geographies. Please introduce us to Monica Elbido's uh, Monica Elbido, the author, and also the book "So Distant from My Life." Okay. Um, so Monique Ilboudou, uh, obviously from Burkina Faso, she was a longtime activist for women's rights. And um, well, she was well known in uh, Burkina Faso in the 1990s for a newspaper column that she ran on, on women's issues. And then she published her first novel in 1992. 
Le Mal de Peau, which has not been translated into English. And that won the National Prize for Literature in Burkina Faso. But like a lot of uh, writers from Burkina Faso for, uh, for many years, she was not able to dedicate herself full time to writing. So she um, worked throughout. Uh, at a certain point, she, was, she also held um, diplomatic posts. She worked throughout, but continued writing. And in the 2000s, she was part of a, a collective of writers that traveled to Rwanda uh, 10 years after the genocide. Um, to produce works to commemorate and also to interrogate that event. How was it possible that that genocide um, could take place? And so from that um, initiative, she, she produced a, a slim novella called Nure Katete. And uh, yeah, it's an absolutely devastating read. And then So Distant From My Life was her third novel which came out in 2018 in French. Uh, and that's the book with which I think she really got international exposure. Um, so the book did quite well in the, both in the Francophone, uh, African Francophone uh, world uh, as in the French French world. And since then, she has published another book, Carrefour de Veuve, which could be translated as Widow's Crossing that deals with the impacts of terrorism on Burkina Bay society. Now, tell us about the book, themes uh, that she dealt with. Yeah, so so distant from my life, I heard one reviewer in New Zealand um, call it a new generation of uh, migrant literature. So its main theme is uh, is about migration. Um, the book's protagonist, uh, Jean Phi, um, is a young sort of street smart African. Um, he's not, you know, he's not miserably poor. He's living an okay life, but he he's restless. He wants adventure. He he's sure that life uh, holds bigger things for him, and so he absolutely gets obsessed with uh, leaving his country and going towards the West. And so he attempts, uh, he makes three attempts to get to Europe uh, before he's finally successful. And his success comes through meeting um, an elderly, uh, rich French uh, gentleman, uh, which then brings in the second theme of the book, um, which is uh, homosexuality and how difficult those relationships can be in, in an African setting. Two very complex themes uh, dealt in a very nice way in a very short novel. Novella, I would say, not exactly the novel. How far has this uh, Penheim grant helped you to get the book published? Yeah, I think the Penheim grant was instrumental in giving me some legitimacy. Um, so I think by the time by the time the grant had came through, I had almost finished translating um, the book. So I was doing that on my own time. Um, but as a first time translator, uh, you know, tr knocking on uh, the doors of publishing houses saying, here's a book I think uh, is really amazing. Um, and also knowing that a lot of English language publishing houses are very shy of translated fiction. It's not every every publishing house's thing. Um, so a lot of non-responses, a lot of no thank yous. So getting the grant gave me a little bit more credibility. And it also attracted uh, attention from, from a couple of publishing houses, uh, including the one uh, with which I, I, I did finally <laughs> publish the book, Tilted Access Press. Tilted Access, they are doing a wonderful job of translation. Absolutely, absolutely. It's it's a fantastic publishing house. What is the current reality about emigration of youngsters uh, from African countries? Right. I, I'm not sure I'm the most qualified person to speak on this, um, but I will say that, you know, it, ironically, you know, so distant from my life, I think is a great story that encapsulates a, a lot of the issues related to migration today. But ironically, Burkina Faso is actually not a 
big, big country of emigration compared to its its neighbors in the region, compared to countries like Mali uh, or, or Senegal. But one thing that I think often is is neglected in in the discourse about migration today is the extent to which um, travel is also a formative experience for that transition um, from youth to adulthood. And certainly, I think traditional Malian culture, and I think also in traditional Senegalese culture, uh, young people were encouraged to travel, young men especially. For women, it was a different thing. But young men, it was part of becoming a man. Partir à l'aventure, leave for adventure. Um, and I think sometimes that, that gets neglected. People think, well, they're just coming for work. Yes, there there is that economic drive, but sometimes it's also just, uh, you know, travel teaches us so much about life. And I think with, with Jean-Phi, uh, you know, the protagonist is so distant from my life, you, you get a little bit of this this feeling because if you, if you analyze his life, um, his life as it is described before he leaves um, the fictional country of, of, of Wabani, it's not that bad. But yeah. he wants to leave. And I, you know, a parallel that I can make is, you know, how many youngsters want to become uh, musicians, knowing full well that uh, there are so many starving musicians, uh, you know, <laughs> who can't make a living. And that does not, that does not dim- diminish the pull. If, if somebody wants to be a music star, uh, they will believe that they will succeed where others have failed and they will try. Yeah. How is the experience of translating fiction? I really enjoyed. I think, you know, I, I have to say that I have the privilege because I'm not a full time translator. I, I choose works that, that really speak to me. <laughs> uh, so that makes it easy. Uh, I'm not sure if I think sometimes full time translators have to translate books that maybe they're not absolutely thrilled about. I'm not sure if I would be good at that, but, um, I really, really enjoyed the process of translating so distant from my life. I'm really enjoying the process of, of translating the the new work that I'm I'm working on. I think in terms of in terms of perhaps translating academic or technical texts, what's fun about the process is that you have this strong voice in your head. I think for me it's important to find the voice of the of the characters and and you have this strong voice in your head that's the choices of of language that you put on on paper. That brings me to the next question. What are you currently working on in terms of translation? Right. <laughs> um, I, I, I don't know if I should make this public because I haven't, I haven't gone very far in terms of the, the administrative part of ensuring this translation. But there's, um, there's a play from Mali that I, I saw performed in Burkina Faso a couple of years ago, and it just absolutely uh, blew my mind by a Malian uh, playwright, Masa Makanjabate. Well, actually, he was a novelist, uh, but also a playwright. The main character is Samuri Touré, so who was um, one of the last emirs of a smallish empire, uh, the Wasulu Empire, that fell uh, more or less during France's colonial conquest, uh, so in the late 1800s, early 1900s. And Jabate was actually uh, a griot. Uh, so the author is no longer living. He, he died in the late 80s. He was a griot, so a traditional um, Malian, um, Malian historian, if you like. And he has this richness of language and just, he, he really paints a feel of what West African court life was like. And, and that quiet, elegant humor of court language. Uh, I was drawn to to the work. Uh, it's also an absolute tragedy <laughs> of, a, of Shakespearean scope. That's what I'm working on now. How important uh, you think is literary expression and uh, bringing translations into English as far as uh, literature from Africa is concerned? Very, very. Um, and uh, I'd say uh, at two levels. One, just in terms of intra-African communication, because, uh, you know, there's the English-speaking part of Africa, French-speaking part, uh, Portuguese-speaking part. 
and it's it's great that these European languages allow um, sort of fluidify communication between Africans, but there's still a lot of artificial divides between those uh, Africans who can read in English and those who read in French. I think it's a pity that taking the same zone, let's take West Africa, that is Sierra Union uh, has very little knowledge of uh, Malian literature just because it's written in, in French rather than English, even though geographically they're, they're in the same region. And I think currently there's a bit of an imbalance. There's a lot more African writing in English getting translated into French than the other way around. So today I think uh, any Senegalese book lover will be able to list uh, four or five contemporary Nigerian writers because that, that work is getting is getting to them in French. But I can't say that a Nigerian book lover um, would have read much uh, literature from Senegal uh, because that is getting translated a lot less. And then the second level on which it's uh, very important is uh, just in terms of accessing a wider readership. And when you look at the realities of the book market in most African countries, Nigeria and perhaps South Africa may be the sole exceptions, you know, that combination of limited disposable incomes and uh, literacy rates um, that are not uh, very high uh, really limits the number of potential readers a, a book produced in Africa and certainly in West Africa has. And, uh, you know, you could have the best book in the world, but um, it's difficult to make enough money uh, to allow you to live as a writer if you if that book cannot travel beyond the region. And so translation is just a, a very important part of that. Finally, please read a couple of paragraphs from the book in French and in English. So distinct from my life. Contrairement à Elgef, François était issu d'une famille d'aristocrates désagentés qui s'accrochaient à leur château en Maine-et-Loire comme au dernier rempart de leur glorieux passé. Après les études de droit qu'ils avaient brillamment menées tous les deux, lui avait rejoint le ministère des Affaires étrangères. Il était arrivé en Afrique très jeune, d'abord comme diplomate. Il avait ensuite intégré une agence onusienne avant de créer sa propre ONG de développement. Séparé de sa première épouse, qui n'avait pu s'adapter ni au climat, ni aux frasques de son époux, il avait épousé une Africaine et pensait ainsi s'affranchir de toute diplomatie ou courtoisie pour asséner ces quatre vérités à ces fainéants d'Africains, incapables de sortir leur continent de l'ornière de sous-développement. Ses propos frisaient parfois les racismes, mais lorsqu'on s'avisait de lui en faire la remarque, il brandissait son permis de critiquer. « Je vous rappelle que je suis mariée à une Africaine, noire », il insistait, au cas où son interlocuteur penserait qu'il était allé chercher femme à l'extrême nord du continent ou parmi les blanches de l'extrême sud. Ah, yeah, so this is one of the passages that uh, just cracked me up when I first read the novel. So here it comes in English. Unlike Elgeth, François came from a family of penniless aristocrats who clung to their chateau in maine loire as the last rampart of their glorious past. Following their law studies, at which both he and Elgeth had excelled, François had joined the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. He arrived in Africa very young, first as a diplomat. He then joined a UN agency before creating his own development NGO. Separated from his first wife, who was unable to adapt either to the climate or to the indiscretions of her spouse, Francois married an African and thereafter felt liberated from all need for diplomacy or courtesy when hurling about his home truths to lazy Africans incapable of pulling their continent out of the rut of underdevelopment. His insights sometimes bordered on racism. But when one tried to point this out to him, he brandished his license to criticize. I remind you that I'm married to a Black African. Black, he insisted, in case his interlocutor assumed he had sought a wife from the extreme north of the continent 
or among the whites in the extreme south thank you thank you very thank you for your time thank you very much thank you anil and congratulations for your podcast i listened to some of the interviews up there very interesting very interesting